Well, my name is Alan Lentz, and I have the pleasure this morning of interviewing uh, lawyer Jim Cameron. Today is September 24, 2019, and this is an interview being conducted for the Legal History Project of the National Bar Association. Jim, good morning. Hello, Alan. Would you give us your uh, full name, please? James William Cameron III. And your date and place of birth? May 20, 1950 at the Baptist Hospital on Church Street in Nashville. Now, I believe you grew up in Franklin, did you not? I did. I did. Tell us about your family, your background in Franklin. Well, I am a direct descendant of the first settler in the town of Franklin. His name was Ewan Cameron. He and four brothers had come from Scotland to North Carolina, and as the story goes, they were run out of North Carolina for selling guns to the Indians. And they came, he came to Franklin with a printing press. His wagon broke down crossing the Harp of the River out where Earl's Fruit Stand came to be for a number of years. And he built a little cabin there. And, uh, you know, the family likes to say he was probably coming with a printing press to counterfeit money. But, uh, in fact, he started the first newspaper of general circulation in Middle Tennessee. It came to be called the Western Weekly Review, ultimately turned into the Review Appeal out in Franklin. Uh, and he had many children. The family, at the time that I was in high school, there had only been one member of the family ever to leave Williamson County. Uh, my and that was my uncle, who was uh, chief of solar research for NASA. He was in charge of the Coupier Flying Observatory that they took up and filmed sunspots. Uh, my father was a traveling salesman. My mother was a homemaker. We grew up in Franklin back in the day when everything closed on Wednesday afternoon and all of the country people came to town on Saturday. Uh, I grew up just roaming everywhere, either on foot or on a bicycle, playing every sport that, you know, you could play, finding glass bottles. You could turn into Jumbo Little for five cents and then buy comic books. And if you had enough money, you'd buy all of the Fantastic Four and then sell them for a profit when you went to school the next day. So. And so you went to elementary school and high school in Franklin? Yes. Went to Franklin Elementary, Franklin Junior High, and Franklin High School. Tell us about your experience at uh, Franklin High School. Well, uh, when I started there, the worst thing you could do was to be caught smoking cigarettes behind the shop. And there were a number of folks who did that. Uh, we were still fairly uh, rural throughout the county at that point. And I remember my uh, football career ended soon in high school when all of the boys from out in the county came to Franklin High School and they were bigger and tougher than, than I was. So that ended my football career. But my sophomore year, uh, which was right after the Brown versus Board of Education case, um, there was an all-black high school in Franklin called Natchez. They closed Natchez and merged the two high schools together. Uh, and that was a in very interesting experience. We had no race relations issues. Uh, one of my classmates was a fellow named Fred Lane, who later became the football coach at Franklin and whose son played in the NFL. Uh, we had uh, a class of probably 350, which was smaller than the class in college when I graduated and went off to college. How did you uh, do with your academics at Franklin High School? Uh, I was the uh, valedictorian at Franklin High in 1968. Uh, ran for everything, was president of everything, all that good stuff. What did you do during the summers of your high school life? 
I uh, sacked groceries for Jumbo Little uh, at uh, his uh, grocery store for several years. Uh, I also dug ditches, helped build some of the drainage for Briley Parkway. And then in uh, 1968, I went to work as a deckhand on towboats on the inland waterways for Ingram Barge Company and did that for the next four years. And after that experience, did you want to go directly into college? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was, digging ditches was no fun at all. You work until 4 o'clock in the afternoon till you can't lift a pick or a shovel, and then the concrete shows up. <laughs> now, I believe you went to University of the South at Swanee. Why did you choose Swanee? Um, I was pretty close to joining the Navy at that point. The Vietnam War was really raging, and rather than become a foot soldier, I decided maybe the Navy was a better option. Um, and Ruth Kennard, who's a former member of the Nashville Bar, was my Sunday school teacher at St. Paul's out in Franklin, and she said, why don't you just send in an application to Sewanee? I'd never been to Swanee, didn't know what Swanee was, even though it was an Episcopal college. And I did, and submit an application. They accepted me, and instead of the Navy, I decided to go up on the mountain. How were your years at Swanee? Did you enjoy those uh, kind of isolated years? Absolutely the most fantastic four years of my life. Uh, what was your major? English literature, which I think was yours as well. It was indeed. And I had the the good fortune of studying under some very talented professors, Charles Harrison, Alan Tate, Andrew Lytle. Uh, there were uh, a lot of very interesting people up there. Uh, a fellow named Tom Ward, who uh, was a Rhodes Scholar from Swanee, was teaching there at the time. Doug Paschal, uh, who became the headmaster at MBA, was my honors thesis teacher uh, and it was, it was an atmosphere when I started it was all male I was in the last all male class to start at Sewanee and uh, my sophomore year this is a terrible story but it's something we did uh, the Dean of Admissions put a board up outside his office and in those days you had to submit a picture with your application he posted the pictures of all the girls and we voted and the first couple of classes at Sewanee were knock out good looking, I'm telling you. But it probably wasn't politically correct even at the time. <laughs> did we you didn't care. <laughs> did you participate in athletics at Sewanee? I ran cross country, uh, did all the intramural stuff uh, through my fraternity. Uh, in fact, I was an ATO at Sewanee, and I just learned that. Mr. Bass Sr., who passed away recently, was also an ATO from Sewanee, and I did not know that. Did you make any really close friendships at Sewanee? I did. Some very good ones. Unfortunately, at this point, all but one are deceased. Uh, I think of the six uh, groomsmen in my wedding, all but one have passed at this point. Did any of your friends later become lawyers like you? A couple of them did. Uh, one of them went to Harvard Law School and was in the class with, uh, uh, what was her name, on the Dobie Gillis show, Zelda. He was classmates with Zelda, and that was always in something interesting. What did you do during the summer periods during your four years of college? Deckhand on towboats. That's when I was really working. I did that uh, four years and uh, covered the entire inland waterways from Lock and Dam number two on the Mississippi River to New Orleans, the Ohio up to Cincinnati, the Tennessee down to Muscle Shoals, uh, the Atchafalaya River down in Texas, a little bit of the Missouri River, Illinois River up to Chicago. Uh, it was interesting experience. And you met a very special person at Swanee, a biology major? Yes. Uh, Tell us about that. My wife Margaret was uh, 
one of the first co-eds up there. Uh, we met uh, on a, the only time I've ever been snow skiing, back when Renegade Resort up at Crossville was open and they were making their own snow. We had a ski and outing club trip and we uh, were on that. She fell down in front of me and I fell on top of her. <laughs> so that was our romantic first meeting. And so she agreed to meet you a second time? <laughs> only under protest. So as you were graduating from Swanee, did you then have to go into the military? No. Um, the draft that I'm sure you remember was, I believe, my sophomore year. And the number that I got was in the middle of the pack. And in Williamson County, they never got to that number that was that high. And so by the time that I was graduating in 72, things were de-escalating over there. Uh, I won, uh, and I decided at that point I was going to go to law school, applied and was accepted at Vanderbilt, and then um, was awarded a scholarship to go to Oxford for a couple of years to Keeble College. And um, as I was getting ready to pack my bags, the Episcopal Church said, uh, we're sorry, but we've run out of money. And so they weren't going to fund that scholarship any longer. And uh, at that point, I had turned Vanderbilt down. So I stayed out of school a year, reapplied, and, and then went on back to law school. Back to Swanee for a minute. What, what made Swanee special for you? The relationship between the teachers and the students. It was an intimate relationship. One of my professors invited whoever wanted to come over on Thursday night and listen to classical music. And uh, of course, as with most things, Suwannee, there was alcohol involved. <laughs> but uh, you could sit there and you could listen. There was nothing that you could not go to a professor and ask about. And they were more than happy to foster that relationship. It was unlike anything I've seen before or since. Did you ever consider any, um, anything other than law school, medical school, business school? Second week of law school, I decided I had screwed up. And so I went up to the Vanderbilt bookstore and picked up the organic chemistry book. After about two minutes, I decided maybe I had not screwed up and that there was no future in organic chemistry for me and since that was a precursor to getting into med school, I said, let's just settle down and go back to, back to work. So you were out for a year mm -hmm. from the time you graduated at Swanee until you started in Vanderbilt Law School. Mm -hmm. What did you do during that year? I worked for a company that is now called Equifax. I uh, worked over in Murfreesboro. Uh, the company was called Retail Credit. And what we did was investigative insurance reports on people that were applying for big insurance policies. Why did you choose Vanderbilt as opposed to Duke or wherever? I don't know. I guess I was from here. Uh, the Well, I tell you, one of the primary reasons, the dean of the law school at that point was John Beasley, who I went to church with. And so he encouraged Vanderbilt, and I said, sure. So that's what I did. So tell us about your first, maybe the first year at Vanderbilt Law School. What was that like? Um, I was amazed at the intellectual quality of my classmates. Everybody was smart. There weren't any dummies uh, walking around the halls of Vanderbilt Law School at that point. I had graduated. <laughs> yeah, you had graduated. so. I would make that exception. The, uh, uh, but what also happened to me at that point was that my dog and I were living in a trailer out in Pegram, Tennessee on Sam's Creek Road. The trailer, by the way, is still there. And uh, in order to support myself, I was going to have to work. Uh, I'd taken out a loan to go to law school, and, uh, but I still needed work. So I got a job working as a law clerk for John Toon. How did you get that job? A friend of mine named Bill Rainey, who was the New England Life general agent, 
uh, introduced us and uh, talked to John, and he hired me right, right then and there. And uh, so I started law clerking midway of my first year and then clerked from there on out through so law school. So you were going to law school and clerking? Yeah, I was working 50, 60 hours a week at the law firm while I was in law school. And living in a trailer in Pegram? Me and my dog. Uh, what about the intellectual rigor of law school? How did you enjoy or not enjoy that? Um, I thought there were a lot of teachers who, pardon my French, were full of crap. Uh, I did not enjoy their style of teaching. I felt that they were remote. Uh, there were some that were absolutely marvelous. Uh, Professor Hartman in contracts, just special kind of person. Um, there were others that I did not have that same respect for. And after I started working at a law firm and I saw what was going on, I wanted out so bad I could taste it. And so from then on, I didn't try to foster relationships with uh, teachers there. I had Tom Sherrard as my consumer law teacher, his first year teaching, and uh, that was an enjoyable class. I enjoyed getting to know Tom, uh, but I couldn't even tell you the names of half the people that uh, were teachers at that point. So you were going to school full time, you were clerking almost full time. Were you and Margaret married by this time? No, we were still dating. She was getting her master's in microbiology up at Western Kentucky. And so we, uh, we would commute whenever we could, but... Uh, now, the late John Toon was partners with the late Irving Entrican. Yes. And when I started clerking, there were only really a handful of law firms in Nashville that were firms in the sense that we know them today. Everything else was an association of attorneys. And you know, the firms were Gullick, they were Waller, they were Bass, they were uh, Bradley A. Rand, or they were Dearborn and Ewing. Everybody else was an association for the most part. And so that firm when I started <clears throat> was Butler, McHugh, Butler, Toon, Thompson, and Watts. That included Fred Thompson. Uh, I got to help pay the rent for Fred for a couple of years during Watergate, and he never came back to the firm. Uh, it was after that that uh, John Toon and Irvin Entrican got together and formed, with Howard Butler, formed Butler, Toon, and Entrican. And that stayed that way for a couple of years, and then it became Toon, Entrican, and White, which is what it is today. So after three years of law school, you joined that law firm? Mm -hmm. Yes. As an associate? Yes. What was your first year of practice like? Trying not to step on a landmine and blow my leg off. <laughs> I uh, was working mostly with John. Uh, and, and John had three big interests. Uh, one was the Nashville Metro Airport Authority. He had been the first chairman of that, and he didn't believe it was appropriate for the firm to represent the authority while he was on the authority, and he was exactly right about that. Uh, and so he got uh, Ogden Stokes to do that work. Um, then John was involved with home builders, and he got Tom White associated with that work. And then his third area of interest was automobile dealers. And that's where he put me. And so I started working uh, in that area. Did he choose you for that, or did it just kind of happen? I don't know. I guess it could have been some of both. Did you have a particular interest at that time? I didn't have a clue. Uh, you know, you go through law school, and I went to law school, because I wanted to be Jimmy Stewart in Anatomy of Murder. I wanted to be a small town guy who could pitch, pick up his fly rod at lunch and go down to the creek and catch something. Um, 
In fact, I was very close to going to Buffalo, Wyoming and practicing. Uh, and then Margaret and I got married and we decided to stay closer to family at that point. And did Margaret take a job in biology? She was working in um, research at Vanderbilt Hospital for uh, Dr. Ian Burr, Dr. Jürgen Froelich, uh, who was a German doctor over there, and he wanted Margaret to come back to Germany and set up an institute with him over there. And I told him, I said, uh, we called him Chris. I said, Chris, I can't practice law in Germany. And he said, you won't need to work. I'll pay her enough money. You can just enjoy being over there. And I didn't do it, Dad Gummit. I should have taken that couple of years and gone to Germany, but, you know, that's hindsight. So did your practice focus almost from the get-go on automobiles, or did you have a broader practice? Trial law, wills and estates, business law? We did pretty much everything that walked in the door for a while. Uh, didn't do wills and estates, uh, did do business law. Uh, when John was practicing, he handled the sale of two or three car dealerships while he was alive. And since then, I've done over 250. Uh, things changed. When I started, every automobile dealership in this area was owned by a family. The Reeds, the Beamans, the Wallers, you know, um, the Boyds. Now I can count on one hand the families that are still directly involved. And it's all been conglomerates from the outside. In a way, sort of what happened to our banking and insurance business here in Nashville. So how soon after you <clears throat> started practicing law did you and Margaret get married? Uh, same year. The very same year? Mm -hmm. 1976. And you have what, two or three children now? Three children, two boys and a girl. What do they do? My oldest son is an electrical engineer with a software company called Silicon Labs. He lives down in Austin, Texas. My daughter is married to a fellow that's a property developer, and they're in Austin, Texas. My youngest son is uh, trying to make a career out of college. Uh, he is uh, working at a BMW dealership in Boulder, Colorado, and taking uh, online courses to get a degree in computer science. So it's not likely that any of your children may be lawyers? No, my oldest son has thought at one time or another, when it's time not to be an engineer any longer, he might go back to law school and become a patent lawyer. Uh, and I've said, I know nothing about that. And you have two grandchildren? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Young. Would you think at some point in their future that law would be a good profession for them? The way my grandson argues with his parents, perhaps. So, Jim, as your career progressed, you focused more and more and more. Well, initially, you did a lot of consumer protection work. Yeah. The Tennessee Consumer Protection Act was passed just before I started practicing. Bill Koch, if you remember, was uh, with the Attorney General's office, and uh, Judge Koch was uh, one of the principal drafters of that. We had that. And then we had a flurry of legislation. We looked at one point, and there were probably 250 laws and regulations that kicked in the minute a car dealer opened the front door every morning. And this regulatory stranglehold that had taken over the business, somebody had to figure that out. and so. That's one of the things we started to do, uh, whether it deals with personal privacy or consumer rights or, or any number of different things that apply. Uh, there's just a landmine out there waiting to be stepped on all the time. 
So the first eight years of your practice, you focused on dealerships. You did uh, consumer credit matters. Um, then there was a big change at the firm after eight years. Tell us about that. Well, John passed away. Uh, and I was doing more and more and needed more support. Uh, and so I decided to go to a bigger firm. And at that point, uh, my good friend Craig Gabbert was over at uh, the Harwell Howard Hine law firm, and I went over there and was over there f for 12 years, 15 years, something like that. And so I got to go from basically an association of attorneys to a pretty good sized law firm. There were probably 30 to 40 lawyers there when I was there. And I was able to get support in areas that I did not have it previously. And that was uh, a, a really good learning experience. They were, the Harwell guys were doing some pretty sophisticated merger and acquisition work. Well, what was your work life like? Were you, you're an early morning riser. Were you chasing the hours, 15 hours a day? How did you evolve as a human being in the law practice? Well, that's one of the reasons that I'm not sure I would encourage a child to go into law practice is because it is so driven by hourly fees. If there were some other way to do it, I would sure like, you know, to know that. Uh, and I think that you have to balance things. Uh, I remember when, when my kids were starting to play baseball and I was coaching the team, uh, you know, I made the conscious decision that 20 years from now, my kids are probably going to remember me being with them out there on the ball field uh, with their buddies rather than me coming home and saying, man, I built 200 hours last month. And so you make those kind of conscious decisions. Sometimes you miss some work. Uh, that's okay. Uh, sometimes you come home from vacation because something needs to get taken care of. I've done that. Uh, sometimes you take work on vacation, and I still do that. Uh, but the reward is working with those clients who appreciate what you do. Many of them look at you as a tool that you're nothing more than a necessary evil uh, who gets in their way. But there are several clients who you become close with, who you respect and they respect you, and that's really the magic that comes in with practicing law. So how many years were you at the Harwell Hine firm? I want to say 12, 15 whatever, and at that point, we're up to about, gosh, I'm trying to think of how long Glenn and I have been together. At, at that point, Glenn Worley, who was a tax estate lawyer, and Ben Fordham and I decided before we retired, we wanted to, uh, have our own law firm, have it smaller, not have to deal with the politics of a big firm. Um, and so we struck out on our own. And I'm thinking we did that in 2000 or 2001, something like that. And uh, so uh, we were together and Ben decided to go in-house with community health systems and he's general counsel out there now. And Glenn and I have continued on with the practice uh, for 18, 19 years now. So why did you choose to locate in Maryland Farms as opposed to Central Business District in Nashville? Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, one primary reason was that I hated the downtown traffic. What was You could see what was coming. It was gradually becoming more and more of a stagnated environment for moving around. 
Um, I had also, Margaret and I, when all the kids were gone, moved back out to the country. We live uh, 10 miles past Leapers Ford. We're so far out in the woods, people say that even the Episcopalians are handling snakes. <laughs> and uh, so coming to Maryland Farms was a 40 minute drive as opposed to an hour drive going downtown. Mm -hmm. So I said, we need to be out here and it has worked very well. Clients do not want to come downtown. They like coming to Maryland Farms and so far we've been pretty centrally located. So Glenn does tax work. Mm -hmm. Ben did health care work. He did health care work and he did litigation work. Mm -hmm. um, and you did mainly the automobile dealerships. Which was both regulatory, litigation, and uh, statutory compliance. Type so things. how did you guys keep the cohesiveness of the firm together when you had three kind of separate types of practice? We were friends. We respected each other. Uh, we could go and talk to each other, which is essential in practicing law. You've got to have somebody to be a sounding board, somebody who can give you a sanity check about different things. And uh, so we continued to do that. We continue to do it today. And in fact, as I have become one of the older members of the bar, I have younger lawyers who will call me up every now and then and say, what do you think about this? I'm in this situation, what do you think about that? And some older lawyers do that too, don't they, Jim? <laughs> well, uh, I think we, we have a responsibility. You know, practicing the law is not an easy thing to do. Understanding what professionalism is is something that is not taught in law school. Uh, it is something that is lost uh, in some law firms. The concept of earning as much money as you can and winning does not always equate to being a professional. You can't go home and talk about your practice with your spouse or family. And so you're going to need to talk to another professional hopefully not a shrink, but another professional who understands. And you can say, here's my dilemma. You know, conflicts of interest are just a fertile ground that is so difficult to navigate. Um, and I treasure the folks that I've been able to pick up the phone and call and say, you know, here's the situation I'm in now. What do you think? and get some good advice that either reinforces what you were thinking or says, son, your boat's heading in the wrong direction. You need to make a 90 degree turn. Uh, Looking over the law practice itself, if you weren't really specializing, have great expertise in automobile dealership law, what other areas of the law would be interesting to you? Litigation. Um, Litigation is the art of persuasion. You do a lot of litigation, do you not? I have done. I am doing less and less as time goes by, and I'm trying to focus it on areas like uh, handling cases in front of the Motor Vehicle Commission, those kind of uh, administrative type things. I don't do personal injury cases. Uh, years and years ago, I did some domestic relations stuff, but that that is such a dangerous piece of work because it can get inside your head and it can affect your relationships. And so I finally walked away from that years ago. What has been your experience with mediation as opposed to litigation? I think mediation is a wonderful thing if you've got a good mediator. And the mediator needs to be able to tell people that you're going to get your butt kicked if you maintain this position at the courthouse. And there are some mediators who are really good at that. Others that are more wishy-washy, mealy-mouth, and those are the ones I avoid. Would you ever want to be a mediator? I have. Uh, I went through the Rule 31 training, 
and in fact I have mediated disputes uh, between car dealers. Uh, at this point I don't see me jumping into it full time like some folks have done simply because there's too much other stuff that still needs to get done. I have brought on a, an associate who's been with me a couple of years thanks to your referral and uh, getting him involved in the, in the business and the practice because when you develop an expertise and you take care of clients and they recipro reciprocally take care of you, I think you've got an obligation to make sure that one day you don't just turn off the light and go to the house and these folks are left out there. And so I am really trying to be able to pass that torch to somebody else who's willing to uh, jump into this field of law and it's very interesting. There's a lot of dynamics. There's a lot that's changing. Looking forward to the next 10 years of your practice, mm. how do you think it's going to change? Uh, I don't see mine changing a whole lot because I'm trying to narrow my focus. Technology has been the biggest change over the past 20, 30 years. Technology has enabled me to uh, have less need for a secretary because I type all of my own stuff. Started doing it in high school, did it in college, and, and have continued doing it. At the same time, one of the drawbacks of technology is that it has um, made it too easy for lawyers not to talk to each other. Uh, as Judge Higgins used to say, back in my day, lawyers would sit down with a glass of whiskey and talk about their cases and get them settled. Do people not even talk to each other anymore? And I think he was onto something there. Uh, people don't talk. Uh, it used to be nothing to bump into somebody and have lunch with them and say, you know, we've got this case and we've got that case. What are we going to do about that situation? People don't talk to each other. Um, I talk to the lawyers that I know. I try to talk to lawyers that I'm meeting for the first time and be respectful and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, you see too many people that shoot off smart aleck emails and uh, most of the time they probably wish they could take them back but if you had a son or daughter who were starting out in the law practice what words of wisdom would you give them about how to conduct themselves in the practice find an older lawyer that you like and respect and suck up to them get to know them emulate what they do, what they say. The first five years of your practice is critical because you will form your reputation for the rest of your practicing days. And if you come across as a slickster or somebody who cannot be trusted, then you are going to have problems. Every lawyer that I've known needs a friend at some time or another. You need to make friends when you practice. Um, and at, at all times, you've got to be professional. You know, you can do that without compromising your client. But there is no sense in some of the nastiness that has come into the practice of law because somebody saw a lawyer in New York or Philadelphia do it. You know, we're not New York, we're not Philadelphia, and God help us if we ever become those kinds of environments when it comes to practicing law. Jim, let's shift over to <clears throat> things that are interesting to you and things you've done in your life other than the law practice. I know you've been very involved with the Boy Scouts. I guess now the Scouts. Well, <laughs> 
I won't get started on that. But yes, uh, I believe that we have an obligation to give back to the community uh, in a number of different ways. This is something John Toon preached over and over, the obligation uh, to, to do something. When I was 28 years old, John asked me to go to lunch. And we went over to the Capitol Club, or the City Club, I guess it was. And we come to a table, and there's four or five fellows that I don't know. And he introduces me to Cliff Harrison, the head of the trust department at Third National Bank. He introduces me to Charlie Cook, the chairman of Third National Bank. He introduces me to uh, two or three others, and they're all one big shot after another. And John said, we want you to be the scoutmaster for Troop 31 at St. George's. Well, at that point, I had been the scoutmaster for about three years for a small troop out in Spring Hill, Tennessee. And all of my older boys had gotten their Eagle Scouts and all, and so I was ready. Margaret and I were getting ready to start having kids, and so I was ready to move my focus back towards the house when I became the scoutmaster at St. George's. It was one of those offers you can't refuse. And so I did that for four or five years and got to make some lifelong friendships. I'm now the oldest living scoutmaster for Troop 31. Uh, a couple who came along after me may have been a little older age-wise, but every scoutmaster prior to me is deceased. Not always thought I'd choose to think about but and so I've I've done I did that in the process of doing that I got connected to uh, the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association and my good buddy Charlie Penley and we started whitewater paddling uh, I was an open canoeist uh, I never really enjoyed kayaking so I, what I was not a butt boater uh, and we spent about the next 15 years whitewater paddling all over the Cumberland Plateau, North Carolina, North Georgia, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, various places, uh, and taught, became an instructor for whitewater canoeing, uh, and did that until I uh, blew out a knee in 2005 and couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. Well, you were also, as I recall, a baseball coach. I coached Little League Baseball for years and years. How did your teams do, Jim? Most of the time we got our butts kicked. <laughs> but one year we were a runner-up champ, uh, and it wasn't whether you win or lose. It was the fact that you had little kids out there playing baseball, having a good time, and uh, you just had to make the adults behave like adults and let the kids have fun. And so I, I did that. Well, did, did the whitewater canoeing experience lead you into the water quality control? Yes, I was board? very concerned. One of the, the most pristine, best paddling creeks anywhere in Tennessee is called Clear Creek. And he runs up on the plateau from uh, outside Crossville down to uh, where it uh, runs into the Obed River uh, down around uh, Wart Wartburg down there. And the city of Crossville was interested in uh, sucking about three million gallons of water a day out of Clear Creek, which was going to devastate the recreational use of that creek. Uh, and so through my connections with the Tennessee Automotive Association, I was able to uh, get appointed by the governor to the uh, Water Quality Control Board. And I have served on that board for about 20 years now. In fact, uh, I serve as the chairman for our hearings. And uh, last year, uh, the TDEC decided to uh, put together the first water plan for the state of Tennessee. I was in charge of the subcommittee for surface water 
uh, doing that. And so I still serve on the Water Quality Control Board. Does the board get support from the politicians that run our government? No. In fact, some of the politicians decided to take as much power away from the board as they could uh, to leave it in the hands of the administrators. And so where we used to hear all of the contested cases, we can now only hear an appeal of a contested case and then only based upon the record. We will not see any witnesses, we won't do any of that. So it's a pretty much a changed experience. We still have the obligation to pass on what's called the triennial review every three years, reviewing the water standards and all that stuff to make sure that we're doing the best we can. Now, one other thing, Jim, I know you do and do very well is garden. Tell us about that. Well, um, when Margaret and I moved out to the country for the second time 12 years ago, we decided that we were going to try and grow as much as we could. So we have about an acre of vegetables under cultivation. We grow just about everything you can name except for melons and corn, uh, beans, squash, zucchini, okra. Uh, Why not melons and corn? I can't stay ahead of the raccoons. Uh, they steal and chew on the melons. They bend the ears of corn down and take one bite and then move to the next stalk. Uh, what so about deer? Deer will come in and eat your field peas. And they'll come in and eat your greens, but they won't touch the okra and they won't touch the corn or anything like that. So, What's, but, your, what's your favorite tomato? Cherokee purple. Or black crimp. They are both very, very good. Now, do you have help out in this large garden, or do you do it yourself? It's just me and Margaret, yeah. My neighbor Jeff has got a uh, big old John Deere, and he turns it for us in the spring. Uh, but we've gotten to the point now that we uh, uh, have gone, we've got 25 raised beds. So we're doing a lot with raised beds, and the issue there is crabgrass you got to fight the stupid crabgrass. So far, the crabgrass is winning, I hate to say. Do you like music? Is that interesting to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. What you types know, of music? You name it. Uh, I'm not that wild about jazz. I like blues. I like Kevin Mo. Uh, I like classical music. I like country music. The Ken Burns show that's on right now is just spectacular. I've played guitar for about, oh, 50-something years now. And that's, you know, personal pleasure to do that. I grew up in Franklin in the middle of all this country music. And I remember being over at Mr. Sam McGee's house. He was part of uh, Sam and Kurt McGee, original Opry performers. And he had a set of Gibson Hummingbird guitars. There were three or four of them. One was red, one was yellow, one was green, and there may have been a fourth one, but they were the most beautiful guitars you ever saw. So, Jim, are you an acoustic guitarist, a bass guitarist, lead guitar, rhythm, all of the above? Acoustic. Picking and grinning like uh, Roy Clark. Have you ever thought about going on stage and being an actor in a play? Did that in high school? got over it. Well, one thing you've not gotten over is being a novelist. And that may surprise a lot of people how many novels you have written. Well, so tell us how that started and how you're doing with it now. Well, it started with events that happened my senior year at Swanee, where one of my classmates was, was abducted by a bunch of hooded football players, we'll say, and taken out into the woods and tortured all night, stripped naked, covered with molasses and feathers, and brought back to the middle of campus the next day with a sign around his neck 
saying I'm a cheater. And that story actually made national news. It got picked up by the AP. But anyway, so I decided somebody's got to tell that story. And so I wrote that in my first book. And I took some of the characters I had created, and I've done six more novels since then. I've got one I'm finishing now and another one that I'm about halfway through, which I'm retelling the Haney Gurley Bill Powell story, uh, which was a famous murder trial in Nashville just before I started practicing that involved John Toon, his father-in-law, uh, who was the lead defense lawyer, and a number of other Nashville characters. That was Jack Norman? Yeah, senior. And John Hooker Sr. was involved? Mm -hmm. Hal Harden was involved? Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that story. <laughs> tell, us, tell, uh, tell us about some of the other novels you've written. Well, uh, <clears throat> the second one, because of my involvement with the water board, I'm familiar with the fights over water that are going on throughout the southeastern United States. One of those threatened fights is between Georgia and the state of Tennessee. Georgia argues that the line that separates North Georgia and Tennessee was, was incorrect and it should be a mile further north than the line has been for the past 200 years. And uh, so I took that story and changed it up a little bit and provided that there was a uh, third party who actually owns the disputed territory that involved the Cherokee Nation. Uh, the second, the third book, I let a Bengal tiger get loose in the Savage Gulf wilderness area and he was up to no good. Uh, uh, let's see, what happened in number four? Well, it's four, five, and six. I know in number six, which is called The Bishop. In The Bishop, I go back and pick up a storyline involving a fellow who was an Episcopal bishop, but who was also an agent for the OSS in the United States. And his job was to identify the communist agents at different military installations. His job was Oak Ridge. So I put him trying to figure out who the bad guy was at Oak Ridge. And those, uh, that story goes around and winds up in uh, Wilson, Wyoming on uh, Fall Creek Road in Wilson, which is a place you know well and uh, and then, uh, you know, I've got some other stuff. When do you find the time to write novels? You've got this incredibly busy practice. You garden like a crazy man. You do all these things in the community. When do you write? You write early in the morning. You write late at night. When you get a gap and nothing's happening, you might write. You make notes. You think about things. You remember, that was interesting that somebody said. Um, and you, uh, you just think about how you flesh out your characters and keep the reader turning the page. How do you do that? So you gotta have action, you gotta have stuff going on. You know, John Grisham, I do not say I am anything like John Grisham, but John Grisham always said his formula was pretty simple. He took a good person and put them in a bad situation and let them work it out, you know? So part of it is endurance, just having the, uh, uh, the will to get through it, to push to the end, to have stuff that, that seems interesting and doesn't drag. Uh, we were in England last year and I was working on number six and I was able, we went to a place, there was one of our folks that was leading this trip, this landscape artist, and he took us to uh, Hidcut House and um, showed us what a ha, ha was. I don't know if you've ever seen a ha, ha but a ha, ha is a, it's a berm, so to speak, 
that when you look out, the view is unobstructed. But if you get to the edge, it drops off. And for some reason, the Brits call it a ha-ha. And so I was able to take that and put it into the story uh, just to explain what it was. Jim, looking back over your practice, your career, if you could do something different, what might that be? Spend more time with your family, less chasing billable hours, more community involvement? I don't think I need more community involvement. I think that I would probably have spent more time at the feet of some of the older lawyers. Uh, General Butler was a marvelous guy. Morning, General Butler. Early bird gets the worm. Who wants a damned old worm, you know? Or Bill McHugh, who was the only person that uh, was so skinny you could x-ray him with a 60-watt light bulb. Uh, John Toon, you know, what a guy, died at age 53. He would have been governor of the state of Tennessee, perhaps a U.S. senator or president of the United States if John had lived. And I wish that I could have just spent more time with them, kind of the, the same way that you think about old friends or family or something like that. Just give me a few more minutes. It's like Bear Bryant said, have you called your mom? Wish I could call mine. I think one final question, Jim. What are the values that you think a successful lawyer should have in his or her practice? Above all, be professional. Be willing to work hard. Be willing to put yourself in the other guy's situation. Understand what he's dealing with and good lawyers figure out a way to settle problems. Uh, be professional above all else. Be honest. You know, I think of the Boy Scout oath every day. And every one of those things applies to practicing law. Well, thank you, Jim. This has been an excellent morning for both of us. We appreciate it very much. And this will be the conclusion of the interview. Thank you.